Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a very familiar audience, so that's a very comfortable feeling. Uh, today we'll be talking about financialization in Turkey. This panel is uh, organized by the Debt and Financialization Research Network Turkey, which is a recently founded uh, research collaboration network that focuses on issues of debt and financialization in Turkey. We're trying to eliminate different aspects of financialization in Turkey. And we are uh, happily supported by the Research Institute on Turkey. You can find more information about this uh, on defire.info. If you're interested, we'll be posting the video recordings of this as well as the audio recordings online and uh, most probably also the presentations uh, if all authors uh, agree to present, uh, to, uh, to publish. Yetkin Borlu is a postdoc at Penn State University. Uh, he's also a high school friend of mine. It's very, very rare. Uh, you, ha you happen to be presenting on the same panel as your high school friends. The, he, his paper will be on uh, farming and financialization in Turkey. Let me just uh, bring this up. So, yeah, I'm a uh, postdoctoral research associate right now at Penn State. I uh, finished my PhD uh, degree uh, last year, uh, 2014 May. And this is just part of my, <coughs> this is a, like a piece from my uh, dissertation. It's forthcoming in rural sociology as well. So um, I'm really happy uh, to be able to uh, share this with you because it's a relatively new piece. And I will be really happy to get your feedback, to your thoughts, because I'm having, uh, doing a little bit of a mind exercise here about how we can look at the issue of uh, financialization, how it applies to um, agriculture, and especially to a structure, a cultural structure, or another economic structure, really, where we will see uh, a number, a large number of uh, small scale investors producers, however we want to think about it, and how their dependence on credits as a consequence of financialization um, improves some of the, uh, might improve some of the uh, conditions they have, uh, given the limitations, of course, and how it uh, might put them, put those small scale uh, producers, investors, um, entrepreneurs, as uh, the, uh, some of the economists would like to call, Right. How, uh, what kind of a disposi uh, disadvantage position uh, does their dependence on credits uh, put them into? So, uh, yeah, and just uh, corn production in Turkey uh, as a new uh, area of uh, economic production is just a case. Uh, just to think about the ways about credit dependence and uh, small scale uh, investment. So, I want to give you a little bit of a background. Uh, about agricultural production and uh, Turkey. Um, as Özlem mentioned, uh, just like in uh, household, in the household sector, in the uh, development household, uh, house development sector, uh, agriculture, the agricultural sector has experienced, went through an uh, important restructuring as well, economic adjustment, right? Especially after the uh, economic crisis uh, uh, in 2001. So, uh, the previous uh, cultural system uh, was dependent on um, on state support, right? This state support was uh, channeled through um, state-owned uh, enterprises, uh, as well as uh, press supports given by these uh, state-owned enterprises, as well as state-supported uh, producing cooperatives. So, uh, price supports was really the backbone uh, of the system. So in the two, after 2001 crisis, uh, we see a major restructuring with the, the story we must have, most of our are uh, familiar with, right? The uh, adjustment, uh, structural adjustment conditions uh, put by, uh, forced by IMF and as well as the World Bank. So we see, we've seen a phase out of government supports uh, in agriculture, especially in price supports and in input subsidies. Uh, another uh, condition, another uh, uh, condition for economic restructuring was uh, privatization of state enterprises. We have seen uh, privatization in tobacco production, 
the state enterprises in tobacco production are privatized right now. <coughs> the uh, sugar, beet, uh, sugar pro producing state enterprises are on the agenda of uh, privatization and people are right now concerned about whether uh, tea production enterprises, uh, tea enterprises are going to be privatized as well. So uh, in this period, especially starting in the early 2000s, we see an increase in the uh, corporate activity, like the, uh, the increasing role of the corporations uh, in the in the agricultural sector. Uh, some of the uh, sociologists, agricultural sociologists, call this as like a shift to a corporate regime, like corporate food regime. So, uh, in line with this, at the same time, we see a decrease in the number of producers, right? I mean, most of you guys in this room are probably familiar with the uh, egg culture, like land, holders, land holding structure <coughs> in, in Turkey. Um, most of the uh, land is held by the uh, small scale and medium scale uh, producers in Turkey. And uh, large scale producers are more regionally concentrated, but their numbers as well as uh, their uh, land hold, like sharing land holdings, uh, is uh, lower than small and medium scale producers. So, uh, keeping this structure in mind, there has been a significant decrease in the number of producers, right, from 8 million producers in terms of employment um, to 6 million producers. And at the same time, we've seen a uh, decrease in the uh, withdrawal in the uh, production of commercial crops that were supported by the state enterprises uh, in the pre-2001 uh, context. Like, commercial crops like sugar beets, right, tobacco, tea, uh, as well as cotton. Uh, cotton was uh, one of the major crops, staple crops for small scale producers uh, that supported their livelihoods uh, over the years in, in this like state supported uh, agricultural system. Right? So uh, this overall shift just represents a shift from a state supported system to a corporate uh, market system. So uh, where does what does corn present, like maize represent in this shift? It was one of the important alternative crops. And uh, we've seen a, a big push from the uh, corporations in the markets uh, that are dependent on uh, maize production, like sweeteners, sweetener producers, uh, as well as uh, animal feed producers. So in terms of sweeteners, you can think about, we can think about Cargill, one of the large uh, corporations that are active uh, in, in Turkey and one of the uh, important uh, corporations, familial corporations, but not, not a public one, uh, in the United States. <coughs> uh, in terms of um, uh, feed production, we see that uh, another corporation called CP, it's a Thai uh, corporation, uh, that is one of, which is the largest uh, feed pro producer uh, across the world, so and that is the that uh, leads the feed production in Turkey as a uh, large share in the feed production uh, sector. And those two industries are really pushing uh, corn production, like creating the de demand uh, in in, uh, in Turkish markets. So looking at it from an input perspective, right? When we look at inputs. Seed is the most important one, high, high yield varieties. Uh, the corn seeds that are not traditional, right? Not like sweet corn, but a type of uh, corn that is used for industrial processing, right? Uh, that is, most of that uh, corn is produced by Monsanto, DuPont, and Syngenta, uh, three large uh, global uh, biotech <coughs> companies that invest in, in uh, creating high yield uh, varieties, especially in seed soybeans, uh, wheat, and corn being just one of them. And yeah, when we look at the consumption side, 90% of the corn being produced over the 2000s uh, in Turkey is being absorbed, being consumed by these corporations, uh, by sweetener and um, animal feed uh, producing companies, right? So in a, in a way, the producers uh, are shifting from a state-supported system to a system where they basically uh, producing uh, for corporations, right? So kind of providing an input uh, for uh, providing a raw material uh, for, the, for an industry, 
rather than just selling it uh, by themselves out on the market. So where does financialization uh, fit in this picture, right? So <coughs> uh, looking at financialization, we can look at consumption credits, right? Like credit, uh, uh, consumer credits, as well as uh, in, the, in the case of Özlem talked about, um, we talk about a lot about uh, credits being used for um, uh, residential investments. But in terms of production too, credits are a really important uh, part, uh, a factor of financialization. With increasing financialization, we see a larger dependency uh, in the economy uh, on credits, which is the case in Turkey as well, especially in agricultural production. So the um, agricultural credit supply uh, increased from $4 billion to $22 billion just in how many years? Like seven years? And in 2004 figures, sorry, 2014 figures, was around uh, 32 billion uh, Turkish liras. And so uh, it's, it's quite a jump, uh, it's quite an increase uh, in terms of uh, agricultural production depending on, on credits. So you can just think about this as a shift from uh, agricultural producers uh, just relying on uh, state supports getting better prices from its state enterprises as well as uh, credit unions to a model where they rely on credits and produce for corporations, right? So, the, I'll just give you a little bit of sociological background just to confuse a little bit more. So, uh, in terms of financialization, there are two aspects uh, as well as economic restructuring. There are uh, two, uh, two main perspectives about the consequences uh, of this process. So one, one is just uh, like fields like uh, geography, uh, like economic anthropology, as well as sociologists use really intensively. Dispossession, right? Dispo accumulation by dispossession. Uh, it's similar uh, conceptualizations like enclosure, right? Um, which represents one of the consequences, potential consequences, especially for small-scale uh, producers, investments. You can think about like just small-scale farmers or just someone who owns a, a small-scale workshop, right, trying to uh, produce something by themselves, but using microcredits, right? But then the, uh, the story that we hear most of the time, it's not a story, of course, it's reality, uh, but uh, most of the focus is, is on how these small-scale producers cannot really cope with the burdens of, of debt and credits, especially mic microcredits, and then just give up, sell their uh, assets, so sell all their investments, or it's being appropriated by the crediting institutions, right? That is the um, focus uh, most of the time when we talk about financialization, and especially within the uh, microcredit uh, context. There's another um, uh, perspective, though. That doesn't like, really exclude the consequences, the real consequences of uh, this possession, but adds a little bit more detail about what, what can about what can happen uh, when small-scale producers, small-scale investors use uh, credits, which is the the idea is that small-scale producers can be integrated, can be an integral part uh, of of the corporate markets and can function within that, right? Uh, of course, the story doesn't end there, right? So I'm trying to take that one step further. Okay, what happens to small-scale producers uh, who depend on uh, credits and are struggling to, to sustain their livelihoods with the help of, uh, not with the help of, but depending on, on credits. So just, uh, it's, it's a rather uh, Turkish audience here, uh, I thought. Uh, if if there were a little bit of a more uh, American audience, uh, I could give some uh, examples for that. But let's say the farm crisis in the United States in the Midwest uh, in the 1980s and the elimination of like, the uh, decline in the numbers of small-scale producers uh, is one example for this possession, right? Uh, integration of small, small farms uh, in the context of agriculture. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, small-scale producers, simple commodity producers, being really driving the driving force 
uh, behind the commercialization of export agriculture uh, in the south in Southeast Asia, spe in especially like special specialty crops. Um, think like I, I can't really think about the uh, specialty crop here, but um, more specialty crops like coffee or uh, bananas, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. We see the small scale producers being really active agents uh, participating in export markets. So there are these two perspectives that like do we really have like does one have to exclude the other one or can we really come to a, a more comprehensive framework that we, where we can really uh, understand the um, consequences of financialization and credit expansion for small scale producers, right? So this is just my main question. <coughs> So what are the potential consequences of financialization uh, besides this possession? Right? What, what other consequences can we think about? Right? So I came up with this uh, idea, with this concept of entrepreneurial exploitation. Right? How can you make an investment but still be exploited as a small scale producer? So the gist of this really, the main idea behind all this, when you have a market structure that, uh, there, where there is a uh, large number of small-scale producers, right, who are dependent on credits, they, are, they might derive some profits from this investment, right? But for sure they are going to have lower returns because, because of their dependency on credits. So their dependence on credits is, is going to decrease their bargaining power, right? Their power to bargain with the um, industry um, uh, of the sector they are investing in, right? So, whereas large-scale producers or investors who have a larger access to resources, right, who are not uh, as much dependent on uh, credits, um, they can use credits or they might not, right? It's kind of a uh, choice for them, right? So they can dis uh, transcend this dependency. Uh, I mean, credit usage doesn't really represent a dependency for them, right? Because they can invest in the market otherwise as well. Right? They have a higher bargaining power, they get better uh, deals, uh, and they, they have higher returns from that. So I'm, I'm just really interested in how small-scale producers or investors are participating in a sector uh, which is largely dominated by uh, corporate demand, right? by, by private demand, uh, instead of being supported by, by uh, different state mechanisms. So. Uh, what did I do in my case to support all these claims uh, and this idea of entrepreneurial exploitation? <coughs> I did a really short uh, field research. Before this, to support uh, all this field research, I played around with numbers a little bit, ran some statistical models, and I thought, okay, I think I should just really focus on, on some regions uh, where there are uh, uh, more higher likelihood to run into small-scale producers and get their perspectives. Uh, about how they decide to uh, shift to corn production, which is an alternative crop for them, right? Uh, whereas they were producing other crops that were supported by dif different state enterprises. And uh, what kind of different answers can I get from them? So I did that, uh, my field research in Sakarya, uh, which is uh, like northwestern um, area, uh, region in, in Turkey. <coughs> where uh, corn actually grows naturally, right? But there is a, a long past of uh, industrial corn production as well, um, where farmers have been ha had a, a long experience with uh, uh, high yield uh, corn production. And whereas in Izmir and Manisa region, uh, people were uh, producing, were involved with corn production uh, more so in the in the 2000s, uh, like late uh, 90s but more so early 2000s, and the yields have been increasing in this region. More and more farmers have been investing uh, in corn production. So I just wanted to uh, compare these two regions and see how different uh, small-scale farms with different backgrounds uh, make these decisions uh, to invest, and what the consequences are. Right? So, first group of findings, decline in the forest regime, uh, it's just this like state-supported uh, system of agriculture, right? How that uh, shift happens uh, and is replaced actually for the most part with, uh, with corn production. So 
Um, in Izmir and Manisa region, cotton was one of the uh, large uh, commercial crops for small scale producers, I mean, as well as large scale producers, but because there was state support behind that, um, it, was, it was still a crop that was uh, being produced by small scale producers and they were uh, receiving, getting some profits from this. And in the uh, Sakarya region, uh, sugar beet production uh, was, a, was another uh, crop, I mean, another sector where they were getting, um, uh, deriving profits. And the uh, factory in, in Sakarya, as well as all across Turkey, right now they are being trying, uh, the, there is an agenda to privatize uh, all these factories, is a state owned factory. There was a state owned factory, uh, but it got privatized. Uh, in the um, after uh, like mid 2000s, so uh, the market conditions, in short, for cotton uh, sector as well as for the sugar beet sector became unpredictable uh, for for producers, for small scale producers. So they were not able to, uh, they they were not uh, assured about the uh, future of these crops, whereas. Uh, and when, when you look at corn, there is an increasing demand from corporations um, who are processing all, all, this crop, uh, all this corn being produced. So on the one hand, you have a, like an unpredictable uh, conventional crop market sector uh, like sugar beets and uh, cotton. On the other hand, you have an increasing demand from corporations for corn. So uh, producers uh, had a, had a more economic incentive to shift to corn uh, for to make money, right? But all the context is changing, uh, all the context of the sector is changing, uh, as well as the crop itself. So the crop shift really, shifting crop really represents a, a shift in the uh, type of production and relations of labor, uh, rather than just like a simple shift, oh, I'm not going to produce corn, so I'm not going to produce cotton or sugar beets, I just want to. The underlying mechanisms are more representative of a, a system a regime change uh, along with relations of labor. So uh, another factor why farmers want to, wanted to uh, shift to corn production is because, especially for cotton, uh, for cotton production, they were able to eliminate labor costs, manual labor costs, uh, which, is, which has been an increasing and I'm not going to say problem, but uh, cost of production. So with, with a shift to uh, corn production, which is all mechanized from planting to uh, harvesting, they were able to eliminate all the production costs. So they didn't need any more labor, especially in the western regions of Izmir and Manisa. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, they, they saw as uh, a benefit of shifting to corn, whereas the uh, the diversity of the crops uh, they are producing, at least for, for cash, uh, has declined over time, right? So, the other uh, group of findings which relates uh, to the influence of, of credit use uh, and dependence on credits um, in, the, in the production of uh, corn. So, uh, corn production has high costs, right? Uh, the seed is commercial. Uh, all the, for the, all the mechanical processes, like from planting to harvesting, we need to pay cash. So small scale, uh, especially medium scale farmers, find it dif difficult to uh, fund it by themselves. Uh, fund, uh, find resources uh, to cover all these costs, so they resort to credits, right? So that's where the dependence really comes in. Dependence on credit comes in. So and when we look at, the, um, as I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, just like the general um, agricultural structure in Turkey, uh, the, in corn production as well, the majority of producers, just in numbers, uh, represent the majority. And so we see a, a large pool of uh, raw material suppliers who are dependent on credits, right? And, but uh, of course, this, this dynamic represents the production uh, patterns of small and medium scale producers. But when we look at small scale producers, we see uh, another source of credits. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, the, 
the majority of funds credits come from uh, private and public uh, banks, but small scale farmers are more likely to resort to their own merchants, right? Who uh, they sell their produce to as a source of credit, right? At the beginning of planting season, they just get credits, advanced uh, cre um, credits for um, seeds as well as uh, fertilizer, right? And with the condition um, of paying all this uh, at the beginning of the harvest season, right? But in that case, when they make that deal with the, uh, with a the merchant, they seriously um, limit their uh, con their choices of marketing because they have to sell to the same person at the end of the harvest season. So uh, on top of depending on credits, right, uh, they have they are limited um, uh, in terms of uh, marketing options as well. Uh, if they uh, decided to get credits from from a merchant, so. All this brings us to the conclusion that um, use of credits, right, uh, especially if the small-scale producers uh, get credits uh, from merchants, uh, are, uh, are losing their position of bargaining, right, uh, losing a, a significant uh, bargaining power. Uh, one of the factory owners uh, I interviewed uh, told me, uh, he was like really honest about that, like at first he was like really uh, difficult to talk to, but after talking a while, he was uh, he, he he was more uh, open about his opinions. So at the end, towards the end of of his uh, of the interview, he told me dealing with large scale farmers is difficult because they have a, a higher bargaining power, right? The small scale farmers are easier. You send the trucks, pay them, receive the produce, end of the deal, right? It's pretty easy and quick. So what are the conclusions, right? Uh, large number of small-scale farmers uh, and their dependence on credits contributes to exploitation by the industry and um, of course in order to generalize this because this is just a case study right and I have, I have a little bit of theoretical discussion about this in order to generalize I think we need more uh, more research more more studies and I think um, looking at other sectors would be really useful as well in order, in order to look at the uh, uh, impacts of uh, credit dependence of small scale producers. So uh, I think entrepreneurial exploitation could be adopt, it could be used in, I mean, it doesn't have to be called entrepreneurial exploitation, but this idea of credit dependence of small scale producers can be found in other economic sectors as well. Yep. Yeah. References and my contact. If you guys want to get in touch with me. All right.